Matthew um, chapter uh, four, five, <laughs> thank you. Matthew chapter five, um, and we're in, beginning at verse 13. So it's page number 969 in the Blue Bibles if you want to follow it. So Jesus uh, says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people stand, and it gives light to everyone in a house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is, up, is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Um, let's pray, shall we? Gracious God, we um, thank you very much that we have this freedom to meet and gather together to sing your praises, to hear your word read, to come together to try to help one another understand it and to live it. And we thank you for the presence of your spirit with us. We do ask, Heavenly Father, that your spirit would illumine these words to our hearts and our minds this morning. In your name we ask these things, Lord Jesus. Amen. The, the passage we've read is a biggie. It's got, it, it's, got, it's got a huge amount going on in it. I don't know if we'll be able to get through it all in this morning. So what, what we'll do is I'll talk for a bit. And then after, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or so, I'll shut up and we'll have a chance to talk about it together. Um, it, it presents us a big question, a really big question. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Christ? This is a big question, and it's not a question I like very much. Um, in my day job, I'm a, I'm a theologian for the Church of England, and I can spend my life asking all sorts of questions about God and about Jesus that feel much more comfortable to me because they don't demand anything of me. And what is divine being? What question? I like those questions. They're fascinating to me. And they don't require anything of me. They don't demand anything back of me. But this question does. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? In this question... All the, quest all the other questions and concerns I have get picked up, put on one side, and Jesus says, gently enough to me, me, what are you going to do about me? He's asking that question of us this morning. What are we here going to do about Jesus? That's a big question. How are we to live as followers of this one? Now, I don't know what your version of my day job is, Work, family, friends, all of them good things, all of them presenting questions, problems, things that need to be wrestled with. But all of that needs to be held in relation to this more fundamental question that Jesus very gently but very definitively gets up in our faces and says, me, what are you going to do about me? Um, we're in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. Um, I don't know if you found as you've been as you've read through the Bible, it's a strange thing. We have four different portrayals of Jesus' life. That's a really odd thing. Why not just one? Why do we have these four different presentations of Jesus' life? Why not just harmonise them all into one comprehensive one? In part, it's because it reminds us that Jesus is bigger than any one presentation of his life. We can't have one comprehensive account because he's, he's too big, he's too vast. <laughs> He's too mysterious to have one window on him. So we have these four. But it also reminds us that these Gospels, these books that we read, were written to a particular group of people. They're written for a particular purpose. They're telling the story of Jesus' life, 
Yes, but they're telling it to a particular group of people for a particular set of reasons. The Gospel is named after Matthew, who it's who is attributed to. Matthew is one of Jesus' disciples, the one who was a tax collector. So a tax collector, you know, read, pant in, read traitor in the Jewish mindset. Someone who's collecting taxes for the imperial power. Matthew was a Jewish tax collector, read traitor to the Jewish people. That's who this gospel is attributed to. And this gospel, this, these words on a page that we have before us, didn't start out life as words on a page. They started out life as sermons. They started out life as Matthew was teaching to a group of people about who Jesus was and what he did. They started out life in that context. Stories that Matthew was telling to a particular group of people for a particular purpose. That's really important because Matthew was preaching to people to tell them who Jesus was, to speak into their life and say, this is who Jesus was, this is what he did, and he calls you to follow him. So who were they? Who were this group that Matthew was talking to? There's clues littered throughout the Gospel of Matthew around who, who he was speaking to. I don't know if you've ever read it and you've noticed that Matthew keeps on saying this happened so that these, this prophecy from the Old Testament would be fulfilled. Have you noticed that in Matthew as you've read it? He keeps on saying this happened so that prophecy you read about in, in the scriptures would be fulfilled. He says it so often, it sort of gets a little bit, no, I'm not going to say it gets a bit boring, um, but he says it a lot. This happened so that would be fulfilled. And he does something else really funny in uh, Matthew. Um, in, all the other, in the other Gospels, when Jesus is preaching the central message he preaches, the kingdom of God is near, Matthew substitutes God for heaven. So why, why would he do that? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a Jewish, it's a, it's, a, it's a substituting the name of God for some other name of heaven, presumably because he's a Jew, and, Jewish, and, and, and um, it, part of the Jewish religion is to not name God. It's a reverence thing. So to say the kingdom of heaven is a reverence thing. There's all sorts of clues like that. But it all adds up to the people to whom Matthew was preaching were likely Jewish people who had come to believe Jesus was the Messiah. And to these early believers, these early Jewish believers who had come to believe Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited saviour, he was preaching about Jesus to this people, this group of people. And this group have got some big questions. Um, they're following the preaching of this former tax collector, this traitor, and listening to his, his teaching about Jesus. And they've got some big questions to respond to. First, who are we? What is this new group that we're a part of? We believe something really significant that other Jewish people don't believe. We believe Jesus is the Messiah. Other Jewish people haven't believed that. So we are this new group. What sort of thing are we? That's a big question. Who are we? How do we relate to the rest of Israel? It's a big question. Um, second question, what are we supposed to do? When we were, with, when we were within the normal mainstream of, the, of Israel, we knew what we were supposed to do. What, what are we supposed to do as followers of the one that we believe is the Messiah of Israel? What do we do now? Big question, and it's the one that comes right up in the passage we read. What about the law? Um, the law were, the laws related to the Ten Commandments, you know, that story in Exodus where, where Moses ascends the mountain and receives the Ten Commandments on stone tablets to govern the law of his, to govern the way Israel was to conduct its life. What does this new group who believe Jesus is the Messiah do about that? That's a big question. Imagine you've conducted your life along some certain principles all the way through. Now something's happened that shakes that a bit, but what do we do about that thing now? Big question. And the third one, are we on our own? Are we on our own? That the Messiah we are, we're following has ascended to heaven. He's not here in front of us anymore. Are we on our own? We're no longer part of the mainstream Israelite religion. We're following the preaching of this former tax collector. We're following the teaching of this perceived traitor. Who are we? What are we supposed to do? So we've got these three big questions that the people to whom Matthew preached the story of Jesus to are asking. Who are we? What are we supposed to do? Are we on our own? 
So even though Matthew's preaching to that very specific group of people, these are three questions that we, we can very well ask today. Who are we? What are we supposed to do? Are we on our own? And it's to those questions that Matthew's preaching. And alongside those big issues, the way Matthew presents the life of Jesus has got some big themes. The big themes that run throughout the Gospel of Matthew are kingdom and discipleship. At the heart of Jesus' preaching, the central message, whenever you get a summary statement of Jesus' teaching, it goes something like this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe. That's the heart of what Jesus taught, the central message of his teaching. Um, I don't want to bring Brexit up, but the meaning of kingdom doesn't mean a geographical area so much. It's something closer to take back control. It's more about sovereignty. It's more about the rule of God. So when Jesus comes to say the kingdom of heaven is near, he's saying the rule of God, God's action in history has come close. God's action in history is here. In fact, it's in me. Jesus, so when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is near, he's saying, I am the action of God in history. I am God acting in history to establish my way among earth. That's what he's saying. What, God has intervened vertically from above, acted upon history and within history. Repent and believe. A few weeks ago, James Holstead was here talking about repentance, and he spoke about it as turning around. Do you remember that? Um, turn around. So what does it mean? Now the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God has come near in the person of Jesus. Jesus says, what do we do about that? Me. What are you going to do about me? Is the question. Well, the answer, repent, turn around and live a new way. We'll come to that in a minute because it's so close to the second big theme of discipleship. The kingdom of that, the kingdom of heaven. The rule of God brings about a radically new life. God has acted, has established his kingdom in the person of Jesus. He's laid a hold of us and made us his people. Now, how are we to live? What are we supposed to do about it? Um, hold all those things. Because I just want to, last thing before we get into the passage, I just want to show you what the, the book of Matthew looks like as a big picture. Because sometimes... When we read the lectionary readings, which is, um, it's almost like you're parachuting in to certain places for a moment, taking a look at it and then parachuting off again. And it's quite hard to see it in the big picture of the way the book's constructed. So remember, Matthew's writing, these are a series of sermons that Matthew was putting together to speak to a particular group of people. Um, the passage that we've read, well, no, but that, the, the book of Matthew's got six big, six big sections to it. Six big um, um, discussions of Jesus' action, telling us what Jesus did. And every single, and five of those sections culminate in a block of teaching. So on the screen there, the bits in black are where Matthew is presenting us with what Jesus did. Um, so the ministry beginnings and his preaching, um, the kingdom of heaven is near, healings and that sort of thing. After every section, the end of every section, is a gathered block of Jesus' teachings. Um, it's unlikely that Jesus taught all these bits in great big set pieces like Matthew has it. He's collected them together and arranged them at the end of particular actions. And, it, and when you put them all together, it makes five blocks of teaching. That's really significant. Remember, this is a, a, a gospel delivered to Jewish people. Why five? Why five? He's gathered together Jesus' teaching into five blocks. Um, so where we are in our section is uh, that first one. Jesus' ministry has begun. He's proclaimed the kingdom of heaven. He's called people to follow him. And then you have our section, a collection of teaching called the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus explains how to live as, how to follow him. But we have these five blocks of teaching. Remember, Matthew is, is Matthew's orientating this gospel to Jewish believers. Um, one thing he seems to be doing is saying, well, Moses put together five books, five, the Jewish Torah, the five books of Moses are now being shaped to and, and almost engage, there's a line of continuity and almost a supersession with these five blocks of Jesus' teaching. 
Matthew's saying here is a new teaching, a new Moses, a new leader. That's why he's shaped it at these five things, at these five blocks of teaching. Our passage in chapter 5 comes right at the end of Jesus' ministry beginning, um, where Jesus has proclaimed the kingdom of heaven is near, called people to repent and believe. The, question, the obvious question is, well, how do we do that? How do we turn around and live as the followers of Jesus? That's the question. The Sermon on the Mount, which is that first block of teaching which this passage is a part, is Jesus' response to that question. This is how you live as a follower of me. Do you see how the, the gospel sort of shaped up? And Matthew is Matthew's orientating this teaching to what Jesus has just been doing. Jesus has said, "Turn around! The kingdom of heaven is near. God's rule is near. What are you going to do about me? How are you going to turn around and follow me?" That's the meaning. And the Sermon on the Mount comes in that context. This is what it is to live as a follower of Jesus. Okay. Um, so that gives you a little bit about what's going on in the Gospel of Matthew. And now we're into the passage itself. Um, Jesus uses a couple of images to describe how, what believers are like. And they're really odd. Really odd images to describe what believers are like. He calls us two things. What does it mean to turn around and to be a follower of Christ? Well, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And he also calls us the light of the world. These are two really odd images, two really strange ways to describe people. And these two images are to describe what it looks like to be the community of Christ in the world. What does it mean to turn around and to be a follower of Christ? That's the question he's looking to speak into. And these two images are telling us that the community of Christ is from the world. We're ordinary, salt and light are very ordinary things. We're ordinary, we're from the world, and we are for the world. Um, so salt. Salt first. Um, salt was used for a number of things in the ancient world. When I mean, Jesus is saying you're the salt of the earth, he's bringing that up. We hear that phrase a lot. We sort of use it in the sense of, you know, he's a humble, good person or whatever. That's not what Jesus was talking about. When he says you're the salt of the earth, he didn't mean, you know, go and be a good chap. That wasn't really what he was saying. Um, salt was used for a few things in the ancient world. It was, it was basically like an ancient refrigerator. It was used to preserve things, stop things decaying. Um, so you'd smear salt all over your meat or whatever to stop it decaying. Um, Christians are from the world and for the world. Jesus Christ's community is to be in a certain way in the world, with distributed in the world, and one of the things is to be there to preserve Preserve that which is good in the world. That's, the, that's the, one of the purposes of Christ's community. But salt doesn't only preserve. It was also used, for the same reason we use it, to enhance. I mean, I, I love, I'm always having salt on food. I'd have salt on salt. It's dreadful. I and mean, I'm talking to, I can see a doctor in the house. Um, <laughs> I'd have salt on salt. It's used to enhance. You are the salt of the earth. You are there to enhance the world, to make it better make things better um, you're there to be in a community in small ways enhancing that community to make it better than it would otherwise be so those are two nice things you're there to preserve you're there to enhance the third one doesn't sound immediately so nice because um, the third thing that salt was used for in the ancient world was to destroy um, let's say when a one when one power would conquer a village or whatever, and they didn't want that village or town to regroup, they would then salt the earth to stop things growing in the ancient world as sort of a means of war. And this is the other thing Jesus is pointing to, with salt of the earth. Um, I can see a few people shuffling around. Is Alex going to suggest we form a revolution in Farnsfield? Um, you're there, there's a, there is a prophylactic, an impeding effect of salt in the world. It's there to stop. So Christians as salt in the world are there to stop that which is wrong. To notice that which is out of order. Notice that which is unjust. And to act against it. These three things, this is why I don't like that question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Because it asks stuff of us. What am I doing to enhance the world around me? 
What am I doing to enhance this community that we're in? What am I doing to preserve and encourage that which is good in it? What am I doing to notice that which is wrong and to stop it, to do what I can to stop it? I'm sure we can all think around um, things in wider society, things in our immediate circumstances that are wrong. Things that we ought to be doing to impede that which is wrong. We start, I think, in our, in our families, in our homes first. Uh, we start in our families and our homes first. What is not in order? What is not right? What relationships aren't in good order? And it's there that we act to stop that which is bad and to be there to enhance that which is good. And from that place, from our immediate circles, we move outwards into the world around us. Jesus is saying, you're the salt of the earth, get your house in order. Get my house in order. Be there, a follower of Jesus, the salt in the earth is someone who enhances, someone who protects, and someone who stops. That's what, that's, that's what that, image, that image means, the salt of the earth. What do we, in a minute, we're going to have the chance to think, what does it mean to be salt wherever you are, in your families and places of work? And the other one's light. That's a much nicer image in lots of ways. Um, light is a big metaphor in Hebrew thought. It's the first thing God says in the Bible, let there be light, Right? Um, light is a really powerful image of God's action in the world Um, when so um, when it's when the prophets are thinking about God's hope for action they often talk about the light from wherever has dawned upon us right God is doing something to set things right Um, God himself is spoken about as light it's one of the ways that whatever God is is described in scripture light Jesus says I am the light of the world And now it gets extended out to us. You are the light of the world, Jesus says. You are reflecting the light that God is where you are. That's the idea. You are reflecting the light that God is where you are. It's a a call to us to reflect the goodness of God in the communities where we are. All these images aren't just about about what the Christian community is and what it's for. It's to reflect the goodness that God is in different ways in our societies. Or a city on a hill. A city on a hill was used for navigation. So if you were going from one place to another, you'd see a city up on a hill and think, oh, that's that town. I need to be going north of there or south of there. Um, it's to fulfill a role in relation to the world, to make it better. That's what Jesus is talking about. To be a follower of him is to be committed in goodness to the world around us. How are we doing for time? Have I got time to talk a little bit about that? Okay, so those are those two images that Jesus presents. Jesus says, this is what it is to be a follower of me. Salt of the earth, light of the world. But there's a warning in that as well. I don't know if you picked it up. What if salt loses its saltiness or the light gets hidden? Um, It's a real challenge. Jesus does get in our faces. He's annoying like that. Um, If salt loses its saltiness, if if it's so... if the Christian community stops doing what it's supposed to be doing, if the followers of Jesus stop enhancing, preserving, and stopping, if the light gets hidden, if we stop, if, um, then, then how can this thing, how can, then what are we doing as the followers of Christ? In other words, to be a follower of Jesus isn't a status, it's an act. To be a follower of Jesus is not a status. It's something we do consciously, day by day, as we enact the sort of life Jesus lived in the communities we're in. That's the point. To be a follower of Jesus is not just the status, it's an act that we do. Um, we have that really, I want to just get into that, that, and there's a second block of teaching that Matthew's put in here as well, which is all to do with the law of Israel, which is a really tricky passage, a really, really tricky passage. Um, How is it, if, if, Christ, if followers of Jesus are to fulfill this role in the world, to be a blessing to the world, that's not done by rejection of the law that governed Israel's life. So the law, when it says the law, what's being spoken about is the Ten Commandments that Moses came down the mountain with, you, know, um, thou, you shall not, you shall, all that stuff, and the interpretation that followed on from it, the laws that governed the life of Israel. Um, Jesus is saying, none of this is being dispensed with. 
None of this law is being dispensed with, but he's shifting the orientation to it. To be a follower of Jesus isn't a matter of following a legal code. It's a matter of the heart for Christ. Um, in passages outside, in the sections just outside this passage, Jesus points to some of the examples of the commands in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. And Jesus says, that's not, that's not the full extreme of what that law's pointing to. Fulfilling that law doesn't just mean refraining from killing people, right? You can very, you, you know, to fulfill the command to not murder is, is sort of a base case. It's the minimal thing to do, to refrain from murdering. On top of it is the full commitment to the goodness and the sanctity of life. Is full commitment to the good of others. That's what Jesus says. So Jesus says, the law says don't murder, but I say to you, don't get angry. The law says don't commit adultery, but I say to you, he who looks at another in that way has committed adultery in their heart. It's more of the disposition of our heart from which we act in the world. That's what Jesus is saying about to be a follower of him. Um, a little later he says, a good tree produces good fruit. Right? You know that bit in the, in the gospel? It's more around the orientation of ourselves to act in the world rather than following a legal code. That's where that's coming from in this, in this passage. Um, and then you have this, so the law itself doesn't get, the law of Israel is not being dispensed with. Instead, it's being simplified and deepened for Jesus. In another part, he said, someone comes up to him and says, teacher, tell us what the most important bit of the law is. What's the most important commandment? Jesus' response, love God and love neighbor. If you do this, you'll fulfill the rest of the law. So rather than point by point following a legal code, Jesus saying, my followers are going to be people who are orientated in self-giving love to God and self-giving love to others. It's simplifying and deepening and saying it's about who you are. It's about the, the status of your disposition towards other people, how, you, how the love from which you act. Uh, love, the word used there, you'll have heard the word before, is agape. Have you heard that word before? It's a particular kind of love. It's not love of friendship. It's not love between spouses. It's not love of, you know, food. It's a love that is self-giving and poured outwardly. It's a love that doesn't have anything of worth in that which is loved. It's a love which springs out from the heart of the lover, not from any goodness in that which is loved. So Jesus says, the law says, love your neighbor. I say to you, love your enemy too. It's a self-giving love that springs from a heart that's been changed by the goodness of God. So when Jesus says, what are you going to do about me? Follow me. This isn't a, this isn't a muted, inv muted invitation. This is a big invitation to turn ourselves around and to follow Christ. So he has this, I'll finish, I think, with this, um, pointing at this. Jesus says something really troubling in this passage. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, righteousness means acting in accordance with a norm. So if you've got a law, to be righteous is to act in accordance with that law. Or if you've got a picture that is off, you know, that's, you know, all my pictures at home are skewed in some way because I can't put them up properly. So righteousness is putting them back up so that they're level, right? So that they're straight, straightness. So unless your righteousness, your straightness, your acting in accordance with the law exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes, then you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? Uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, um, the Pharisees were the people who thought the way we live as the people of God is obedience to the law of God. And the, the, the assiduousness in which they saw that through was breathtaking. Um, the Ten Commandments themselves led to a series of legal interpretation. That's another Bible again, just in laws. So the Sabbath, for example, the, the rest day, it's got a thousand laws governing it, even around way, what sort of lamp you can move, the condition of a donkey in order to be able to move it. Incredible numbers of laws that these people followed. What can Jesus mean? Your righteousness should exceed that. Your righteousness should exceed that. It's not an exceeding in, in, in it's not a difference in degree. It's a difference in kind. 
Jesus is talking about. It's not being more assiduous in following the legal code. It's a requirement to go deeper into the disposition of our heart. That's what he's saying. Unless your righteousness exceeds this, i.e. not a righteousness of outward act, but a righteousness of heart. That's what Jesus is pointing to. That's what will cause us to be salt and light in the world. A heart that has been changed by the love of God. A heart that has been adapted and made, and made obedient to Christ. There are three things I want to leave you with. Um, and this, on this idea of righteousness. The first is that the righteousness that we have that exceeds the, the scribes and the Pharisees is not one that we earn. It's not one that we earn by doing good things. Fundamentally, it's one that is given us. A pool, one of the early, an early, one of the apostles, spoke about we are justified. We're made right. We're made right before God. A legal declaration of righteousness has been given us freely by the death of Christ in our place. That's the primary meaning of righteousness for us. We are made righteous, we're made right with God on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. The second thing going on is this, an, an Old Testament pro, pro, uh, prophecy that the, ho that the law of Israel was written on stone tablets. God would pour his spirit out on his on believers and the spirit would write the law of God on our hearts. Um, that's the idea here, that God's, God's law wouldn't be something external to us, but become something internal to us, would become part of our character, part of our very being and way of acting in the world. That's what Jesus is pointing to, not just following a legal code, but an actual reorientation of all we are by the powerful presence of the Spirit in our hearts, changing us from the inside so we act in the world as salt and light. And the third thing, if we read that and think, oh gosh, where has this righteousness come from? It doesn't come from us. That's the point of the old, that's one of the big points of the Old Testament. Um, the big, one of the big questions of the Old Testament, will God find a faithful partner in the people of Israel, in anywhere in humanity? And the answer that's given time and time again in the Old Testament is no, he won't. The faithful partner of God is Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one one who has obeyed, the one who has been this heart wholly orientated by love to God and love to other. Uh, it's not looking for another one. Job's taken, no vacancies. He is the righteous one and we share in him. So, and, and we grow more and more into his likeness. That's the point. So the job is done and we're growing into the likeness of him. That's why Jesus says in the same, in the same book, um, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. My burden is light. And this passage doesn't sound like a light burden, does it? But it all has to be held in that context. We're coming alongside Jesus and learning from him with hearts that are changed by the Spirit so that we might be salt and light in the world around us. To point to the love of God, the goodness of God as light. To be for the world. To enhance that which is good. Um, enhance, that so, enhance it so it becomes better. Preserve that which is good and inhibit evil stop the spread of that which is bad so let's pray shall we for the ministry of god's spirit on our hearts so we'll be changed to be more like that gracious god we thank you so much for your goodness to us we thank you so much um, for this passage which confronts us and gets in our faces in all sorts of ways um, and we thank you so much for the gift of righteousness through jesus christ we thank you so much for the gift of your spirit. And as we, as we think what it is to be a follower of Christ, we open ourselves again to the ministry of your Holy Spirit on our hearts, changing us and making us those who, from all that we are, love God and love those around us. It's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.